You are now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 13, and we're going to cover two chapters today for the sake of finishing Genesis on the last chapter, which is chapter 50. Today, we're going to look at chapters 37 and 38. Brother Dustin, you ready to hop into it? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. So we introduce Joseph, and the story starts off by giving us some details about Joseph. Verse 1, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph was 17 years of age while pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth. Let's grab verse three. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. He made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. And so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Let's stop there, bro. So everything we hear about Joseph growing up, you have him in your mind as this little teenage boy. But 17 is teenage years, but you have them like 12 or 13. And this man is almost an an adult. And so when you see his father loving him more than his brothers and giving him this coat, and some translations say very colored, but that word could also mean more cloth, like longer. So the garments are longer meaning royalty. If you were royalty, you would have a garment with more cloth on it because that would represent it was more expensive. And so any way you take that, Joseph is prized highly, even esteemed more than his brothers. So it's creating this hostility. But some people put Joseph as a type of Christ where they say, you can't find sin on him. He's sinless. He's perfect. And I don't think we can go that far in the text. I do think we can state that Joseph is a type of Christ, but I don't think we can state that from the text that he's sinless because you can even see the text kind of poking at, man, this man is old and he's wearing his garment in front of his brothers. And look at that from your perspective. If you're an older brother, would that sit well with you, bro? Not at all. No, exactly. And so he comes to his brothers with these dreams. He has two dreams. One. It, it talks about in verse seven that behold, there were binding sheaves in the field and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed to my sheaf. So that's the first one. And the second one is just like the first one. It says in verse nine, he relayed the other dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and his brothers and even his father rebuked him. But get this, it says in verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. And so now you have this plot against Joseph. Joseph is going to check on his brothers to give a report on how they're doing in, with their work. And they come up with a plot to kill him. But we get the older brother, Reuben, in verse 21, he says, But Reuben heard this, and he rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood, throw him in this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So Reuben had this plot. Obviously, he's the firstborn. He thinks he's the leader, and we already established the text is going to show that Reuben eating the the air. He eating the sea won't flow through Reuben. He's a fraud. He's a wannabe. He's a phony. In fact, we even see the real leader stand up. He's ID'd in verse 26. It says, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. And so, bingo. We've identified the leader. Reuben comes back to the pit and Joseph is not there. It says in verse 31, so they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, we found this examined. I want to talk about something. We 
talked about the theme of ironic retaliation over and over again. Get this, bro. The very same method that Joseph deceived his father with clothing, he put on lamb skin, he put on the skin of an animal to feel hairy like his brother Esau. The very same method that he deceived his father with, his children deceived him with. That's that ironic retaliation that we keep talking about. God is bingo. I got you. What do you think about that, bro? That this keeps coming up. He was a deceiver. Then he met Laban and he deceived his father with clothing. Now his children are deceiving him with clothing. No, absolutely. I see the theme and it's pretty interesting to me in, in verse 20, when his brothers bring this up, he, they said, when they t said they were going to kill him, it says, and then we will see what comes of his dreams. Wow. Bro, we're going to see, aren't we? We absolutely are going to see within the next few chapters. As we wrap up this chapter in 37, it says in verse 36, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Note that phrase, the captain of the bodyguard, because I think it's going to be very important and it's going to come back up and help us. So let's walk into 38. It says it came about at the time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived and bore a son and named him Onan. And so let's talk about this because we have this weird story, this weird answer. We're on Joseph. Why are we talking about Judah? This is significant because the writer uses this to get our attention. He does this a lot. You remember when we would see Isaac committing the same sin that his father Abraham committed by lying when somebody wanted to have relations with his wife? And we're like, man, this is deja vu. What's going on here? The author is showing you something more sinister is going on here. This is an attack. This isn't for you to say, man, why do people keep falling in the same sin? This is get your attention and make you think more deeply about the text. And that's what's happening here to put a story that's not really relevant to the storyline of Joseph. Judah is in the sense that he's his brother, but we're talking about the life of Joseph. And this is right here. And I'll tell you why this is here, because it tracks the seed for us. We'll know most people think quite naturally that the seed will flow through Joseph, right? Because the story is mainly about Joseph. But that's not true. The seed flows through Judah. And we find that out in chapter 38, why Moses will put so much attention on Judah. And look at verse six, it says, now Judah took a wife for earth, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. That's very important. So remember Tamar. And it says in verse nine, Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. So he took his life also. So what's happening here? This is evil. Why? You do not mess with the seed. God gets very involved when that happens. And we see that over and over again. And so Tamar is concerned. She wants, she's a widow and she wants to be married again. And Judah promises her this, and there's a series of deception going on. Tamar comes to him, covered up with a veil in verse 14. She wraps herself and sit at the gateway. And so Judah meets her, and he thought she was a harlot. She deceives him. This is what she says. Let's start at verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, here now, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, moreover, will you give me a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? She said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. We have this setup of Tamar and Judah, 
And Tamar is with child, and she's brought forth to him in verse 24. Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. When Tamar is before him, it says in verse 25, it was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law saying, I am with child by the man. Man, this is so powerful. Whom these things belong to. And so what does Judah say here? You got me. You got me. He said, she says, please examine and see who this signet ring and these cords and staff belong to when Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I. And so he's been pointed out. But what happens through this pregnancy? Verse 29, it came about as he drew back his hand and behold, his brother came out. She said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. And afterwards, his brother came out who had a scarlet thread on his hand and he was named Zara. This is powerful. This story sets up the seed. So, bro, through this union, you get the seed being feathered. And you can see this. Ruth gives us the playbook in Ruth chapter 4, verse 18. Will you just read that first line there? Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez, bro. Where do we get that name from? Genesis 38. And if you follow that, it says, who's the father of Obit? Who's the father of Jesse? Who's the father of guess who? David, Man. our king. Isn't that powerful that how this story is placed smack dab in the middle of the Joseph story? It would be more fitting to call this not just the Joseph story. This is even more so the Judah story. But just like Abraham, just like Isaac, just like Jacob, Judah has to be developed. And we see he needs to be developed based on chapter 38. And he's going to grow into the king that he needs to be by the end of Genesis. And we'll follow that and see that as we continue to move forward. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to drop a breadcrumb. Okay. I, I think a good, we said that sometimes Joseph's looked at as a type of Christ. And I think once we're done with this, we'll be able to see the rescue story. No, for sure. And also, I think it would be good to say that Judah is a type of Christ too, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Man, we'll catch you next time as we look at chapters 39 through 41 on day 14. All right, you all take care.